of it would be radical. Um, that's a word that we hear, uh, well, it's not a word that we so much hear like in its original context so much anymore, but it's a word that we hear on the news a lot more, right? You hear the word radical, like talking about a radical Muslim, uh, you know, radical, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and we hear about these people who are, you know, especially, you know, in Islam, I guess you hear about it a lot right now, uh, but we hear about these people that are just extreme. They're, they're radical in their beliefs, and it causes them to do, you know, just, some would say crazy things. I would say crazy things. Um, and I, okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. Uh, the opposite of that would be, to me, a fan. You know, anybody in here, I'm like a fan. I like the Florida Gators. Anybody else? All right. Uh, <laughs> they're not doing so good this year, so everyone's like, yeah, sure. I kind of like them. <laughs> they're all right. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, but, you know, what does a fan do? They cheer. That's right. Okay, where do they cheer from? The stands. Okay, they're not like playing the game, right? You know, the fan isn't usually the coach isn't like, hmm, I really need someone to – to come down here and win this game for me. I'm going to get you up there in the stands to come down here and play for me. No, you're, you're up there, you're cheering your team on, you're, you're you know, kind of on the sidelines making sure that they know that you're there, or you're at home sitting in your lazy chair falling asleep to the game, um, which I know that happens, trust me. Um, so it's kind of these two opposite ends, right? We have, in my mind, this radical is the one who's out there, like, playing the game. They're out there you know, doing the stuff that needs to get done. Uh, and then we have the fan who just is happy to sit and cheer along the people that are willing to do stuff. Um, so I kind of found these, these two examples uh, in the Bible. Uh, let's just, we'll read the verse. Uh, the number was just an example of the fan. It'd be Luke 18, 18 through 23. It's uh, the, the rich young ruler. Um, it says, and the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Verse 23 says, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Okay? To me, this guy, he's just a fan. You know, he sees Jesus, and it's like when you see the, you know, your favorite sports team walk out, you're like, yeah! You know, you're really excited. You see, and you're like, that's something that's cool. Okay? And he sees Jesus this way, but he doesn't really see who Jesus is. You know, because if he did, whenever he looked at Jesus compared to his great wealth, his great riches, whatever that might be, uh, you know, the comparison, it, it wouldn't really add up, right? I mean, when you think about this is Jesus, you know, this is the one that, that puts the breath in your lungs. This is the one that, you know, makes you wake up in the morning. This is the person that sustains life on the earth, you know, and then you compare that to your riches, it kind of makes it pale in comparison. You know, it kind of makes your riches like, well, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, so in my mind, this is a guy who's, he's really like amped up about who Jesus is. He sees him, he thinks he's like this really cool guy. And we have a lot of people like that. I would say in the world, I'd say in the church, you know, too, a lot of people who are really excited about who Jesus is, you know, but they don't really understand what he's all about. They don't really follow through. You know, they're happy to sit on the sidelines and watch other people do things for Christ. You know, they're happy to be a fan. Um, let's see, I have stuff written down. Uh, the, the man, he admired Jesus, but he didn't really see the worth. You know, he admired who Jesus was. You know, he, he calls him a uh, good teacher, I believe is what it says in this translation. Yeah, good teacher. Uh, and Jesus immediately is like, no one's good except for God. So he's basically saying, I'm God. 
okay? So you see, he immediately says, you know, good teacher, I, you know, I admire who you are, I admire what you say. You know, I, he's probably someone that's been, you know, following him, that's heard some of the stuff that he's had to say. You know, he's saying, good teacher, you know, basically, I admire you, I, I admire what you have to say. You know, I, I'm, I think you're a pretty cool guy, you know, is, is what I'm hearing in my mind. Uh, but when you tell me, that I have to sell my stuff, get rid of my stuff. I have to actually get rid of some stuff. You know, I have to actually do something different than what I'm doing. Then eh, you're not so much worth it. You know, a lot of people on the fan side, you know, we're willing to add Jesus to our lives. You know, that sounds like a good thing, right? You're like, I, I've added Jesus to my life, you know. But really think about that. If you add Jesus to what you're already doing, you're really just kind of adding something else. You know, Jesus is saying you've got to get rid of all this other stuff. You've got to sell it so that I can see that you know, you're, you're real about this. That it, you understand how, what I'm worth. You, know, you understand that I'm actually I'm God. You know, so he's the, the example of the fan. Uh, I, I, the thing I wrote down, he was, he was close enough. You know, he could see what it was, but he didn't want to get his hands dirty. You know, have you ever... I, I'm reading a couple of books. I'm always reading a couple of books because I can't finish one and start another one like a normal person. I have to like read two or three at a time and start from the back because I can't just... It's, it's weird. I'm sorry. I, it's, whenever I pick up a magazine, every time I turn to the back and then start flipping through back, I, it's something wrong with my brain. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, <laughs> whenever, whenever I read a book... And it's explaining to me, like I'm reading this one right now, and it's titled Radical. Uh, I guess that's why I'm thinking about all this. But this idea, I had to actually stop in the middle of it because it comes to a point where you're like, if I keep reading this and then I know what it's all about, then I have to make changes in my life. You know, I have to look at what I'm doing and actually change. And that's the point where this rich young ruler was at. You know, he's like, I see the truth, but I really don't want to make those changes. I really don't want to have to do that. And I would say that a lot of us, I'm going to put myself right there in the mix because I, I stopped reading the book. <laughs> like, I don't want to read this anymore. Uh, that's too hard. You know, we do the same thing. We're like, I'm willing to add Jesus to my life. I'm willing to add church. I'll read the Bible every now and then, uh, you know, sometimes. And, I, you know, I'll do some of the, the religious things. But I'm not really willing to to follow. You know, I'm not really willing to get rid of my, I like my stuff. You know, I'm right there with you. I like, I have some stuff that I really, I have like a, a really nice digital camera. I saved up. I, I'm like, I'm not a saver. I'm a spender. That's just my nature. Uh, but I, my birthday and Christmas are close enough together where I like ask everyone for money and then buy something really cool. Um, it's like just long enough to save that I can just barely ask my wife. She knows. I'm like, I got to buy stuff. Uh, but, you know, I, there's things that I, I really like to have. But I've come to this understanding that uh, those things really don't matter that much. You know, it's just stuff. If, uh, uh, if my camera, if one of the teenagers or my daughter or my wife or, you know, someone broke in and stole it, it really doesn't, it doesn't like change my life, Right. It's just something. It's something that I enjoy, but it's not, it's just stuff. You know? And that's the, the, the realization that this, this rich young ruler, he's like, I really like my stuff. And in order to follow Jesus, I'm going to have to get rid of my stuff. So I'd rather, I'll keep my stuff. You know? I'm going to be happy to kind of see who Jesus is, and that's cool. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about him maybe, or, you know, I'll maybe read some more, or listen, I'll probably listen to what he has to say some more, but I'm not going to go any further than that. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so a fan, just for the, the necessary part of this, a fan is someone who, who watches with great admiration, you know, they're, they're willing to sit there, you know, and fans, I mean, especially if you're a football fan, you'll devote, you know, hours out of your week to sit and watch your team. Uh, you know, you'll have parties, you know, Super Bowl parties, whatever. You know, you're willing to do some stuff, but it's not like you're willing to go all the way in. You know, you're not going all the way. You're just kind of, I'll, I'll submit, I'll uh, take some of my time for it. So a fan is someone who watches in great admiration, but uh, doesn't really want to get involved. 
doesn't want to take any further steps because that means change. Um, okay, so then we have the example of the, the radical, uh, or in this case, you could just call him a madman. I mean, that's the, the first thing. When I read Paul, whenever you read anything about Paul and you read about his life, the first thing that pops into my mind is that this guy was insane. And he was just, he was a madman. He, he didn't care about any of the stuff that was going on. He was just going and doing exactly what Christ had called him to do. You know, he, was, he was a radical. You know, he was something that was different. And uh, let's see, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. Okay, this is basically what, this is Paul kind of giving the list of what he's been through. This is Paul talking about himself. And some of it, the first verse that you read out of this sounds very arrogant to me. I mean, the first thing I think, man, he's pretty arrogant. But then when you read it, you're like, well, he's right. <laughs> um, okay, we'll start in verse 23. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. He, I mean, he says it right there. I'm talking like a madman. Uh, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received the at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pleasure, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Okay, just, just stop there. I mean, just, just think about that, that what he's talking about. You know, I was beaten. You know, more than once I was whipped. When he talks about I was given the 40 lashes, I'm sure most of you guys have already heard what that is. You know, they was said that if you took 40 lashes, that it would kill the person. So they would give them 39. You know, I'm like, man, that was, that's grace right there. You know, I'm not going to beat you to death. I'm going to beat you almost to death. Uh, you know, that would be like my mom. I used to get a lot of spankings growing up. I mean, a lot. And she says now that I didn't, but it's a lie. <laughs> but uh, I remember, you know, it'd be like if she was like, okay, I'm going to whip you 10 times. Or whatever. Okay, I'm only going to do it nine. You know, that's not that big of a deal. That's still going to hurt really bad. Um, so, you know, he's talking about he's been beaten. He's been whipped. He's been shipwrecked. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and you think, oh, there's big things. But then I mean, he talks about just the simple necessities of life. He says, you know, I've often gone, I've been thirsty, I've been hungry. I've been, you know, sleeping and, you know, being exposed to the outside. Uh, you know, I, I've gone with all of this bad stuff that is not any fun. You know, I don't think that, well, the thing is, I think that Paul was probably like waking up and like, yay, another day of bad stuff. You know, because he was a madman. He was crazy. You know, he was radical. You know, that, that's the only way that I can think to describe him is that he went through this and he said that I found no matter what I'm in, no matter what position I find myself, no matter what situation, no matter what it is, I'm going to be content. How, how does that work? I mean, really think about that. How can we say all these things about, you know, all this stuff that I've had to go through, you know, being beaten and tortured and, you know, shipwrecked, stoned. We were talked about being stoned Wednesday night. Uh, I always, <laughs> one of the teenagers, who said it? I can't remember now. But, uh, oh, it was Nick. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> they were, he was like, wasn't he, uh, wasn't he pebbled? And I was like, ah! <laughs> that was so funny to me because that's how I've always pictured being stoned. It's like hey, a bunch of people and they're like throwing handfuls of gravel at you. Like, Get out of here. We don't like you. Man, it is like the worst thing ever. I, I mean, whenever I actually kind of saw a visual representation of what it, it's really like, and it was on TV, so you know it's not as bad as it probably is. 
I mean, it is a terrible thing. To, they don't pick up like little rocks and toss them at you. They've got giant things as big as they can pick up and throw at you, smashing you. And then, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible way to die. It's a terrible thing to have done to you. So how does he say, no matter what position I'm in, you know, being stoned, being beaten, the whole time he's content with that, you know, how is he saying at night when I'm going to bed and I'm not even in a tent or, you know, in somebody's house, I'm outside all by myself in the dark and the cold and there's like, you know, coyotes or something. I don't know. You know, how is he going with that and being content? You know, I don't know about you, but if I miss lunch, I'm not content. I'm like pretty upset. Oh, I'm hungry. You know, if I don't get a good breakfast, I'm not that happy. If I, you know, if... Uh, you know, where I'm living isn't the, if my air conditioner, okay, there you go. That's a good one. Uh, we lived in an apartment. Our air conditioner would freeze up like every other night. They'd come fix it. It'd work for a day and then freeze up again. And man, I would be upset because I'm hot and I, I don't need to be hot. I'm American. <laughs> you don't understand this. <laughs> this isn't how this works. I'm American. I should be nice and cool. Uh, now, I know for some of you guys, you probably grew up without air conditioning, so you're like, oh, who cares? Or you're from up north where there isn't, you know, everyone. But here in Florida, I'm sorry, I gotta have some air conditioning. Um, <laughs> so how is, he, how is he doing that? How does that work? I, I don't, I read it and I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. And the only thing I can think of is he is, he's crazy. You know, that, that's the first thing. And, uh, one of the teenagers actually Wednesday night said, you know, we were talking about all these things. They're like, he's insane. You know, he's, he's crazy. And that, that's exactly the point, is that when you look at his life compared with ours, think, I heard a preacher uh, a few weeks back, and he said this really funny thing. He said, if, if your life was in the Bible, if all of our lives, you know, the Bible would be really big, but they had like your life written down, and then they had Paul and, and the different people in the Bible that, that are all written down, and who would you want to read? Who's like, you would skip over my life. You'd be like, big deal, no air conditioning for a night. <laughs> uh, who cares? You know? Unless I want to read about Paul. I want to read about you know, uh, Peter. I want to read about these people that actually did something, that, that suffered, that, that lived a, a crazy life. Um, yeah, that kinda, it kind of made me think about what my life is all about. You know? It made me think about what's at the core of my life. Is that I've kind of discovered that that's me, and that bothers me. You know, when I figured out, and I don't know why it took me so long, but when I figured out that it's like the me universe that I'm living in over here, uh, that everything is about you know me, and about what I need and what I want, and what's best for me. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, because I like to take care of my wife and, you know, my little girl, as long as it doesn't inconvenience. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, it, it, when it all comes down to it, it's mostly about what, what's best for me. And you know, that bothers me. It, it really, it kind of upset me to really realize that. And it wasn't something that was readily obvious because, you know, I do a lot of things for other people. I, I, I you know, not to, I'm not trying to like toot my own horn or anything, but there's a lot of things that I'm, I do for others. But, you know, when it comes down to the core of the matter, it's really all about me. You know, I'm focused on what I like and what, you know, I'm all about. And that's the difference. You see in Paul, as he wasn't focused on Paul. You know, there's no way that he could be focused on himself and be being beaten and hungry and all that and be like, oh, I'm content, I'm happy. You know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't add up. So we look at Paul's life. I'm going to move my Bible so I can read my notes. Because there are more. <laughs> um, so when you look at Paul, you see he's the exact opposite of what that, that definition of a fan was. He wasn't content just to sit on the sidelines and you know, cheer on the other disciples or the other apostles or the other Christians. Uh, he did cheer on a lot of the, the churches. He wrote letters that encouraged and, you know, we're going through a series right now on Paul in the youth, and it actually takes you to the, the, the prison where he was, the Maritime Prison, Maritime Prison, sorry, where he was, and it's most likely where he was taken out of right before he was executed. 
And you actually, the guy goes down in this, in this prison and shows what it would be like. And it's all clean and nice now because it's kind of a touristy thing. But I, I just can't imagine what it would have been like for him. You know, whenever he was put in there, the prison was already 400 years old. You know, it wasn't like, let's build a new prison for Paul. No, I mean, it was, it was a dirty, dingy, disgusting, dark place. There was no door to get in. This kind of blew my mind. Uh, sorry, going off on Paul. But there wasn't even a door. There was a hole in the floor, and they would open that up and drop the people in and then close the hole back. There was no other way to get out. There was no nothing. It was just, you're in there now. And so this is where he's sitting when he's writing the book of, of Second uh, Timothy. You know? And the book of Second Timothy, if you read it, it's nothing but encouraging. It's nothing but telling Timothy, you know, basically, <laughs> go be radical. Go be crazy. Go tell the people exactly what they need to hear. Go do all this stuff that I've done. You know? <laughs> How does he do that? You know? And then it, it kind of hit me. Well, hold on. The, what's the first thing you do whenever you read about Paul and you hear, hear about all these different you know, persecutions that he went through and all the bad stuff? I'll tell you, the first thing I do in my head, I, I, I qualify it. I go, but that's Paul. You know, he was like a super Christian, right? He had a, a special tunic with Jesus power and stuff, and you know, that allowed him to go through all this. Paul was just like us. You know, Paul was the same person. It, was there a different Holy Spirit that was, uh, you know, giving Paul this power? Was there a different Jesus that he was serving? No. It, it's the exact same. Uh, let's see. I wanted to read Hebrews 13.8 real quick. Uh, just one verse. Uh, Hebrews 13.8. Some of you could probably quote it. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, it's the same one. It's the same Jesus. It's the same person that is living through Paul, that Paul is, is after, that we have today. It's the same Holy Spirit. So what's the difference? Why is Paul just going you know, hardcore like this? And you know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I don't know, you know most of your lives or anything. I know me. You know, why am I just kind of a fan? Why am I not, like, just going crazy? And what's the, why doesn't my life look like that? What's the difference? And you know, it, it kind of hit me, you know, because it's all about me. Once again, it's just coming to that fact. It's all about me. I'm looking at who I am. I'm looking at what I want. I'm looking at what's best for, you know, my family and, you know, my stuff. And it kind of, it just, it kills me to think that that's who I am. And so it comes down to this fact, you know, point number three. I have no idea what time it is, or I didn't even bring my phone. Wait, yes, I did. 11.38. Okay, I've got a little bit of time left. Um, number, ver, point three is that Jesus wants radicals. He has enough fans. Uh, wouldn't you say there's enough people that think that Jesus is pretty good? You know, there's enough people that, that want to add Jesus to their life. We... Uh, we did a missions trip whenever it was like uh, I was 19. It was the year after high school. And uh, we went to Trinidad. And there's these people down there. They're a, a religious group, and they're called uh, Spiritual Baptist. And whenever you talk to them and you talk about Jesus, they're like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I'll just, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, wrong people. It was the, uh, the Indian people, the, the Hindus or the, you know, the Hindus. Um, whenever you talk to them, they just kind of like, okay, well, I've already got 10 bajillion gods already. Jesus sounds pretty good. I'll add him too. You know, I'll just bring him into what I've already got. You know, Jesus has got enough people that are doing that. He's, there, there's enough people already who are pulling him into what they're already doing. You know, he wants radicals. He wants a bunch of people that are sold out, crazy, you know, wholehearted, all in to this life, to his life. You know, and that doesn't matter if you're, you know, 12 years old, 5 years old, whatever, or 105 years old. It doesn't matter. It, you know, your life, there's a lot left that we can do, you know, in our lives right now. 
it doesn't have to be, you know, this great big flashy thing. You know, we can be radical at any point in our life. We can be radical and be crazy and live for Christ all the way at any point, you know, whenever, how old we are, you know. Um, so Jesus wants radicals. Uh, he, he was a radical, wouldn't you say? I mean, he, he was, whenever you read about Jesus and read what he was doing, you're like, man, it's, it's just completely, I don't ever know how to explain that. Just the only thing I can ever think is like, it's holy other, not holy like H-O-L, like holy W-H, like it's completely other. It, it looks so different than our lives. <laughs> it looks so different than what we are doing. Because it, it's just completely other. It's just completely separate and different. And so he, he was a radical, and he set the example for us. You know, he's like, this is what I want you to be like. I want you to you know, be an imitator of Christ. Right, why do they call us Christians? Anybody know? I'm used to like a little group, so I'm be like, hey, question. And people, what is it? Someone answer? I'm sorry. Uh, Christians, let me ask you, was Christians used to call people, was that like a, a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing, exactly. It was like, you're just a Christian. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, you're just a little Christ. And, you know, the people at the time were living in such a way that people looked at him and said, you're just like that Jesus. Man. That's like a crazy thought because I've never had anybody do that to me. I've never had anybody be like, you're just like Jesus. I'd probably pass out and die right there. Uh, it, 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 would, it would be the greatest compliment. And that was why they chose the name. That's why they decided we'll be the Christians because it was the greatest compliment that they could hear to hear that they're just like Christ because that's what they wanted. You know, Jesus is desiring for us to be just like him. You know, we were created actually to to take what God is, to, to, for him to kind of radiate out who he is and for us to bounce it back. And we're just like a bunch of mirrors, basically. We're here to, to be imitators of who he is, to do what he does. Okay? Uh, like I said, he, he doesn't need fans. He needs, you know, wholehearted, you know, sold out. Uh, like the uh, the... The old school way that people, preachers, and evang- I went to a Christian school and high school and middle school, and you always have these evangelists, and they'd come through and swing their arms and, and all this, and their thing they would always say is, they want on fire, and all this, and, and I thought, and that's great, I like to hear it, it's on fire, and uh, you know, it's like a rock star, they're like, Meh. and uh, I don't know why, <laughs> that's completely off color, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, that, that's what I would see is just this on fire thing, and that's, you know, in my head, that's what I'm thinking about, is Jesus wants this radical. He, he, does, he was a radical. He was completely different from what this world is all about. And that's what he desires. You know? And if we, unlike if we, you know, like that rich young ruler, if we look at our lives and what we have and our stuff and our kids, and I didn't used to be able to say that. You know, I didn't understand. I kind of understood when people would be like, you don't understand, you know, it's your kids, it's different. You're like, I don't understand because I don't have kids, so <laughs> it makes sense. But now I do, so I'm in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I've looked at that. Little, I told Natalie last night, I'm like, I'm a tender-hearted person. I'll just be honest. I'm not like a hard person at all. I just, I, you show me something sad, I'm going to cry. That's just the way I am. And last night I told Natalie, I was like, just looking at Amelia's face, you know, she was sitting in the back seat and was getting in the car, and I just looked down at her, and she just looked at me, and didn't smile or anything, she was just looking at me. I'm like, man, that could make me cry, just looking at it, because it's just this amazing little thing, and I'm like, wow. But I had to think, you know, what's more important? Now, this sounds crazy, you know, what is more important? Because you know, when you read about the disciples, they had families, they had people that they left. Uh, I don't know if I write. Uh, yeah, I wrote down the verse. Okay, this is gonna. This is why it's it's crazy to me. Matthew ten, uh, verse thirty four. Uh, Matthew ten, verse thirty four. He says, "Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother." A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those in his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will, will find it. So when I read that, and I look at my daughter, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I love Amelia pretty good. So I've kind of had to, you know, figure this out in my own life. You know, what's more important? You know, where, where's my heart really at? And that, that's what I want to encourage you guys. That's what I want to leave you with today is not this message where it's like, do this and do that. I, I would just encourage you. I, I say encourage a lot, and Evan's always like, you say encourage a lot. I'm like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a step back, to, to maybe take some time today, because we live in a world where it is, there is stuff going on all the time. And there's, there's always TV, there's always the computer, there's Facebook, there's text messages and cell phones and uh, places to go, things to do. You know, it's a, a busy world for most of us. If you're not in that busy world, thank God, because <laughs> it's awesome when you're, you don't have to be so busy. Uh, so take some time and maybe turn off some of that stuff. You know, turn off whatever it is. Take time to examine your life to see what you're, you know, really all about. Are you really about yourself and what you desire and what you need and what you want? Are you really about who Jesus is and following him no matter what? You know? Cuz that's what he desires. He's got enough people that are about themselves. You know, I'm going to put myself in that category. Uh I don't like that. <laughs> it bothers me. But, you know, Look at who you are. Look at what your life's all about and figure that out for yourself. Because, I, I mean, I can't tell you uh, what your life's all about. I, I don't know your heart. I could really, like, I could put on a pretty good show, I promise you. I could make myself look really good and do lots of really nice stuff and be there for every church event and even, you know, do other stuff, go on missions trips and whatever. But it's really about where my heart is. It's really about what's more important to me. And that's what it is. That's all it's about. You know, that rich young ruler, his heart was in his stuff. He saw Jesus. He admired him. He thought he was a cool guy. But his heart wasn't it. He didn't really and truly see his worth. You know? And that's what I would, I would strongly encourage you, just to take a step back, look at your life, figure out what it's all about. See Jesus for who he really is, for what he's really worth. Because I promise you, if you see Jesus for what he's worth, it will change your life. You know, it will make things different. It, it'll make you, it'll make you rattle. Your friends you know, might look at your life and be like, well, hey, you've really changed. You know, you're doing things a lot different now. That's awesome. You know, that's a good thing. That's, that's what I'd love to hear is, you know, you're really, you know, different. You're really thinking about Jesus or you're really like Jesus. Uh, you know, that's the greatest compliment I think we could have. Um, so I, I just, I want to end on that. And uh, let me pray for you. Let me pray with you.